capacity. And the title is the isomorphism program of projective schemes. So please start. Thank you for introduction. And first of all, I like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And so I, I talk about uh, the isomorphism problem of projective schemes. And uh, um, so this is the plan of my talk. So far, uh, so first part is introduction. And after introduction part, I talk about uh, computation of ISO schemes and then the case of one dimensional schemes and next uh, the case of varieties with a uh, big canonical divisor or a big anti canonical divisor. And, and then so we discuss uh, several positivity properties of invertible shifts, which are related to the isomorphism problem. And then uh, at the, the last part of the talk, I talk about the case of K3 surfaces with uh, finite automorphism groups. Okay, um, so let's start. Um, uh, introduction. Um, so what, what is the isomorphism problem of projective schemes? So it is uh, so the following question. So, um, so it, is it so algorithmically decidable whether uh, so two given projective schemes are isomorph isomorphic or not. Um, so in other words, uh, can we make a, a computer program such that if two projective schemes or defining equations of two projective schemes are given as input, then uh, the, pro the program tells you that uh, they are isomorphic or they are not isomorphic. Um, and so I think this is a very fundamental problem in algebraic geometry. And, but um, it seemed that this is an open problem. And, and um, so I got to know of this problem in, uh, in a paper by Ponen and uh, in, uh, in a paper by Ponen about some uh, decidability problem in algebraic geometry. And in, in that paper, he said that this question was asked by Totaro. But I think th this is very fundamental uh, problem. So anybody can ask this uh, question. And, um, and, and recently I also found that the same question was asked, asked in math overflow by uh, Don Arapura and and there, there was some discussion uh, in, in that math overflow thread. And uh, it was written that uh, so we can uh, answer this question affirmatively in the case of uh, smooth projective curves and also the case of varieties of general type. And, and there was some discussion about, about surface cases, but uh, but there was no conclusion about surface case. And um, okay, let me mention a few uh, existing works in this direction. Uh, so this is it's a decidability problem. And uh, uh, I think the most famous uh, work on this direction is uh, Works about a uh, Hebert uh, tenth problem, 
and it and the and it was uh, solved negatively by uh, the Davis Patnam uh, Robinson and Matiasevich. So uh, the theorem says that uh, there is no algorithm to to decide whether a general Diophantine equation has an integer solution or not. So in general, the so decidability problem is very say, difficult, and it it it's often the problem is such a problem is often undecidable. <clears throat> and um, and uh, uh, in fact, a few years, a few, a, a few hours ago, I received an email from Professor Total that, uh, and he let me know the work of Kanel Belov and Chilikov. Uh, the result is a very good result. Um, Kanel Belov and Chilikov, and, and their proof was later simplified by Kolar. And, and so the, the result is about an embedding uh, of, of affine space, so 11 dimensional affine space into an affine variety. And so, so, it, so given an affine variety, is there that there exists an embedding of 11 dimensional affine space into the given var affine variety X and uh, say over Q or Q bar. And they proved that it, this is undecidable problem. So there is no algorithms. Algorithm telling, so deciding whether or not there exists uh, such an embedding. So excuse me. So so why yeah. eleven? So ah uh, uh, yeah, a ten is possible. Or... Uh, uh, sorry, what what is possible? Can, uh, can you repeat? If you change eleven to 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 ten, for example. Or... Um. I don't know why it's 11. I, I, but I think there is a similar result with um, maybe in dimension two, there is a similar result, I suppose. Um, or, in, or maybe A1 or A2, there would be similar results, I saw. but I, I don't re I don't remember. I'm sorry, I, I didn't check. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and also, there is a work of uh, Turon uh, about uh, about the bounded. By rationality and, and bounded isomorphism problem. And as a bounded by, by rationality problem means that uh, whether or not, not to give them the varieties are by rational. And, and is there an algorithm deciding whether or not they are by rational? And, and bounded means that some invariant, uh, the degree is bounded. So is, is, there, is there a bi-rational map of bounded degree between two given uh, varieties? And, and so his work is uh, 
very similar to uh, my approach, um, and, and I, which I explain later. Um, so, bound, so roughly speaking, we if we bound some discrete invariant, then we can uh, compute spaces parameterizing isomorphisms, and then the the problem is reduced to bounding those invariants. <clears throat> okay, uh, um, so let, let me explain. I, I, right now I explained a little bit, but uh, let me explain in a bit more details my uh, general strategy. Uh, oh, maybe before, Doing that, uh, let me remark one thing. So the uh, the so uh, okay. So throughout the talk, uh, so we work over over Q Q bar, an algebraic closure of uh, rational numbers, the, uh, an algebraic and we suppose it's embedded in C. And, and so in, in this field, so numbers in this field can be represented by some finite data and we can manipulate, uh, we can compute uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. So algorithmically and, um, and, and let me remark that uh, the isomorphism problem is uh, semi-decidable. And it means that uh, there is an algorithm that, uh, uh, that terminates after finite steps if and only if, if to give the to given projective schemes are isomorphic. And if two projective schemes are not isomorphic, then that algorithm doesn't stop and continues forever. And we can construct such an algorithm quite easily um, because uh, there are only countably many possibilities. So, um, we, there are only finite, countably many closed subschemes in uh, in the product of two given projective schemes, and we we can check one by one whether it is the graph of an isomorphism. And so, if if two two schemes are isomorphic, then eventually we arrive at a closed subscheme, which is the graph of an isomorphism. So the algorithm stops after finitely many steps, but this algorithm never stops when the given schemes are not isomorphic. So, so this is, it's always semi-decidable and the problem is whether it's decidable. <clears throat> okay, and uh, so general, strategy. Okay, for, so suppose we are given two projective, projective schemes over Q, Q bar and, um, and then for, for each polynomial, Polynomial p with uh, so one uh, polynomial of one variable, one variable with uh, q coefficients. Uh, we can compute so iso scheme between x and y with Hebert polynomial p. So so here we have subscript, subscript P. And so this is uh, some component, some piece of uh, 
the total isoscheme, which is the moduli space of iso isomorphisms from X and Y. And, and but, uh, but there are countably many polynomials and uh, there may be countably many components of uh, isoschemes. And so it's impossible to compute the entire isoscheme uh, at once. And so, uh, so now the problem, uh, so the problem is reduced to to bound uh, uh, possibilities uh, of p so polyno polynomial p so namely uh, we want to uh, algorithmically produce finitely many polynomials such that, uh, uh, so we can produce finitely many polynomials P from the given input such that if there is an isomorphism between X and Y, then, then there is an isomorphism with the Hilbert polynomial among those finitely many polynomials. Then uh, the problem is now to compute isoschemes for those finitely many polynomials and check whether or not they are empty. And so th that's a general strategy. Uh, and then uh, to my main results, uh, which I, I'd like to present in this talk, uh, are, so we can do this indeed. We can bound possibilities for uh, polynomials and we can solve affirmatively the isomorphism problem in certain special cases of projective schemes. And, and those are the case of one dimensional projective schemes, uh, the case of varieties with uh, big canonical divisor or big anti canonical divisor, and the case of K3 surfaces with finite automorphism groups. Um, okay, so. So next, let me explain um, uh, let me explain the outline about computation of ISO schemes. Um, so ISO schemes of two projective schemes can be embedded into Hilbert scheme. Um, so, so ISO, ISO scheme of X and Y can be embedded into Hilbert scheme of the product by sending an isomorphism to uh, to its the class of its its graph graph so gamma f is is the graph of f which is a closed subscheme of x cross y and so determines a point of Hilbert scheme of x cross y <laughs> and and so if if x is embedded in projective scheme. So, um, 
So by a project scheme is given, uh, by saying that a project scheme is given, uh, we mean that it uh, it's defining equations are given. So it's uh, embedded in some project space and uh, defining equations are given. And and if x is embedded in p m minus one and y is embedded in p n minus one, then we can embed the product, their product, into p m n minus one by uh, by segre embedding. And and so the Hebert scheme of x cos y is uh, embedded into the Hebert scheme of p m n minus one. Okay, and and Hebert scheme or projective scheme uh, is that is an algorithm to compute compute it for each Hebert polynomial. So as is well known, Hebert scheme is is uh, the disjoint union of uh, Hebert schemes associated to uh, Hebert polynomials. <clears throat> and for each Hebert polynomial, the corresponding piece of Hebert space, Hebert, Hebert scheme uh, can be computed. And uh, so, um, so I think the first work in this direction is by Bayer, Bayer's thesis, and he ah uh, so and then Hebert scheme is embedded into Grassmannian, and Bayer uh, gave, uh, uh, explained how to compute at least said th theoretically and how to compute defining equations of the Hubert scheme in Grassmannian. And then later it turned out those equations also define the correct scheme structure of Hubert scheme. And, um, and, and uh, so in, in this computation, the uh, Gottsman's Theorem uh, play an important role, and then uh, uh, in my paper in preparation, I I, I followed a uh, present nice presentation by by e. Robino and Kleiman. So it uh, so it it is a book by Yarobino and, and um, it, it is an appendix to a book by Yarobino and Kane, written by Yarobino and Kleiman. And in, in this appendix, uh, it's uh, beautifully explained how to compute the Hubert scheme. <laughs> then, and, and from that computation, uh, it's not so difficult to to uh, compute the Hebert scheme of of general projective scheme, and so we can compute um, Hilb of x cross y for for each uh, Hebert polynomial. So um, so we 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 can compute Hilb p of x cos y for each p. <clears throat> and then um, the ISO scheme of x and y is an open, open sub-scheme of, of Hebert scheme. So, so correspondingly to the decomposition of Hebert scheme, by Hebert polynomials, iso schemes also decomposes and, and 
in and there is a, a part of ISO schemes corresponding to each Hilbert polynomial. And, and, and we can compute this uh, open subset. Uh, so the, the locus, the open locus in the Hilbert P which of graphs of isomorphisms from X to Y. <laughs> so uh, in summary, we, we can copy, compute ISO schemes for each Hebert polynomial. And, and so the entire ISO scheme is a disjoint union over P of ISO P of X, Y. <clears throat> and the entire space is locally finite type and we can't compute the entire ISO scheme, but we can, we, we can do compute uh, each of ISO P, X, Y. Okay, and as, as I said before, now the problem, iso isomorphism problem is reduced to the problem of bounding, um, bounding Hilbert polynomials. Now I'd like to move on to the case of one dimensional schemes. Oh, is there any questions so far? There's no question. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about the case of one dimensional schemes. Um, um, so as I said before, at the beginning, um, in the math overflow thread, it's written that the case of smooth projective, one dimensional smooth projective schemes uh, can be easily solved. And there's modular space and we can define um, the point corresponding to the given curve. And so it's the problem, problem should be easy. It's written in math over over four, and so I generalize a bit. So it's just one dimensional projective scheme. It's not not necessary reduced or not necessary smooth. And yeah, and then uh, and then in, for such schemes, uh, the isomorphism problem is uh the answer to isomorphism problem is positive and how to prove this. Um, so we, we use uh, riemann law for uh, one dimensional schemes, uh, which, which I found in Vakir's book. Uh, I think not it's not published yet, but we, we can download it from his uh, homepage. And, and <clears throat> so it said that if, if X is a projective project scheme, and if X, XI are, so it's a one dimensional, uh, irreducible components, then uh, and L is an invertible sheaf on X, and then uh, Euler characteristic of L minus the Euler characteristic of, of O, the structure sheaf, is the sum over I 
of uh, laying this off uh, of the structure shift at, at the generic point. So eta i is the generic point of xi and times degree. Maybe here, I'm looking at my notes, but maybe this is a mistake. Xi, Xi, I think it's reduced. Uh, mm, hmm? I think it's, this is um, so reduced, associated reduced scheme of Xi. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 we have this riemann roch type formula for general one dimensional uh, uh, projective scheme. Uh, also, he, so this, this is uh, so dimension one. <clears throat> Okay, and, and we use this to, to bound poss possibilities for Hilbert polynomials of uh, potential isomorphism between given one dimensional projective schemes. So, um, um, so suppose X and Y are two, so projective schemes, of uh, dim dimension at most one and um, and xi and yj are also one dimensional uh, so irreducible components of x and y respectively and uh, Uh, and um, and then so this this is a corollary to the Riemann law, and then there is a a there is a partition. Uh, also be, before. Uh, um, okay, let, let me define th th the integer d to be the sum of degrees uh, of m on reducible components. <clears throat> ah, oh, oh, oh. oh. Uh, eh, eh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and L and M are invertible sheaves on X and Y respectively. And D is the sum of degrees of, of, of M on reducible components. And then there is a partition of D into uh, uh, into the sum of uh, positive and mm, no, so this is so very ample uh, invertible shifts, and th then there is a partition of D into into positive integers such that um, the Euler characteristic of, of, of L tends to F inverse M and here, so F is an isomorphism, uh, isomorphism X to Y. And so the Euler characteristic of this is equal to the Euler characteristic of OX plus the 
length of OX eta I times degree L restriction of XI plus D I. <clears throat> So uh, what is this corollary about? Um, so this is about the formula of this, about this uh, Euler characteristic. And uh, this determines the Hilbert polynomial of an isomorphism if, if exists such, such an isomorphism. Then uh, the point is that the right-hand side is independent of F. There is, it doesn't appear F on the right-hand side. Um, so the right-hand side can be computed before knowing or constructing the isomorphism F. <clears throat> and and uh, there are finitely many partitions of D. And so from, um, From this corollary, uh, uh, so there are only finitely many possibilities uh, for the Hilbert polynomial of an isomorphism f x to y if any. <laughs> and we can um, ex explicitly compute these finitely many uh, polynomials. And then we compute ISO schemes uh, for those polynomials th and then check whether they are empty or not. And then so that's it. We, um, we can algorithmically decide whether or not X and Y are isomorphic. So in summary, uh, the theorem, uh, so it is uh, decidable whether or not to uh, given projective schemes of uh, dimension at the most one are isomorphic. Yes. So, th th so this is about the one dimensional case and this proof illustrates how our strategy works. <laughs> okay, now, um, oh, it's already uh, 5.55. Um, okay, let me, uh, uh, next quickly explain the case of, of varieties with uh, k or minus k big. And, and this, so, uh, okay, so, um, here by varieties, I mean smooth varieties. So, uh, so we work for smooth varieties and, um, and and we, we want to bound the possibilities for Hilbert polynomials. And so, so uh, okay, so let X and V, the X and Y be such smooth projective varieties Uh, smooth so project varieties. And, and, and suppose for simplicity minus, um, 
Okay, and, and suppose they have a big anti canonical divisor. So this case is a bit more uh, difficult than the other case. And, and, and in this case, uh, so two bound possibilities of Hubert polynomials, uh, we apply uh, Kodaira vanishing. And for, uh, to do so, we, we first replace, uh, so first replace, replace uh, uh, so given, given so very, very ample invertible, invertible shift L with, with, with some power of it. Um, and so we, we can assume that L times uh, omega inverse anti-canonical shift is ample. And actually we, we can check whether a given invertible shift is ample or not. And, and so we can do this. And okay, then um, we, after such a replacement, we can show that uh, by Kodaira vanishing, uh, so if F is an isomorphism between X and Y, uh, we have vanishing of higher homology groups of uh, of uh, we have vanishing of these homology groups, and then uh, and we also have an embedding of sheaves into uh, Q, 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 Q. uh to my of minus two Q L and Q Q is some uh some positive integer explicitly computed. And and so we can bound the dimension of the zeroth cohomology groups. And, and so and so we get bound on H zero. And then um, the eight dimensions of H zero for for finitely many errors are more precisely for L from one to the dimension, or maybe possibly dimension plus one, uh, determine the Hilbert polynomial of an isomorphism F. So bounding H zero gi uh, gives you the bound of Hilbert polynomials. So now uh, from given data X and Y, we can produce uh, finitely many polynomials algorithmically. And then uh, so again, compute ISO, ISO schemes for those polynomials then, uh, then check whether or not they are empty or not, uh, they, whether or not they are empty. And, and that's how uh, we, we can decide whether two such varieties are isomorphic or not. So, uh, so as a consequence, it is decidable uh, whether or not uh, two smooth uh, irreducible project varieties uh, is k or minus k big 
uh, isomorphic. <laughs> okay, and and now uh, so we use the bigness of a uh, canonical sheaf or anti-canonical sheaf. Uh, we consider as a special class of varieties with this positive positivity of canonical or anti-canonical divisor. And so it's natural to ask whether it's decidable that a given invertible sheaf is big or ample or neck. So, so decidability of various positivities of invertible sheaves. And, and uh, this decidability of positivity, uh, various, various positivity, uh, it's also related to the isomorphism problem of K3 surfaces, K3 surfaces, which I'd like to uh, talk about later. So, Um, so next, I'd like to talk about uh, positivity of invertible sheaves. Okay, um, so firstly, um, so firstly, it's easy to show that uh, very ampleness of an invertible sheaf on a projective scheme is decidable. So this is decidable. And we can check this by, by uh, computing the rational map associated to the sheaf and check whether or not it's embedding. <clears throat> then uh, the ampleness. Uh, on smooth variety, right? ampleness of an invertible sheaf on a smooth variety is also decidable. Um, so here, smooth, smoothness assumption is, uh, it was necessary for me to put this smoothness assumption uh, because uh, I need to, compute intersection numbers to, to apply Nakai Moishizon criterion. <laughs> so on one hand, we can check uh, each part of the sheaf is ample or not. And on, on the other hand, we check the intersection of, of the sheaf with uh, each closed subset. And a irreducible closed subset. Then um, after finitely many steps, we find it's very ample or it's, it has negative intersection or non-positive intersection with some closed subset, then, then we find out that it's ample or it's not ample. And so ampleness is decidable. And and but, but can um, I have a question? Can I have a question? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you have a uh, you have infinite, infinitely many uh, irreducible sub varieties, right? So how can right. you? So what what you mean by decidable here? You mean uh, you do... so here? So we run two different algorithms simultaneously. One algorithm is to to compute uh, morphism associated to powers of the sheaf. And if the sheaf is ample, then after finitely many steps, we find that it, the, the morphism is embedding. And so some power of sheaf is very ample. And so the sheaf is ample. And on the other hand, we try to prove that it's, the sheaf is not ample. And so there are countably many closed subsets and then compute intersection numbers. And if the sheaf is not, Ample, then after finitely many steps, we find some closed subset which intersect with the sheaf uh, non positively. So, so, so maybe yeah. you mean se semi decidable or like because so, I mean, you don't, we, we prove that two yeah. semi decidability. 
So okay. uh, ampleness is semi-decidable. Uh, on one hand, we, we prove that ampleness is semi-decidable. And on the yeah, other but, hand, we yeah. prove that not ample, not being ample is also semi-decidable. And so ampleness is decidable. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I need so one, to one property that. is yeah, thanks, semi Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and, and 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 so but uh, ne, um so so th this is semi decidable but uh big bigness is uh so we, we can easily show that it's sem semi decidable but uh this seems difficult to show that it's decidable and and, and not not nef is semi decidable but it seems difficult to show that it's decidable but in the case of canonical sheaf maybe we have some hope and for for nefness we can uh, apply um, the abundance conjecture and so if the abundance conjecture is true then our uh, we can show that the nef the nefness is also decidable. And for bigness, we have a result of uh, Tsuji, Heiko, Makanan, and uh, Takayama. Uh, it says that uh, there is some, uh, for each dimension, there is some fixed number. And if you take that power of canonical uh, shift, then the associated map is uh, birational onto the image. And, and that uh, specific number is uh, computed in dimension one, two, and three. And dimension one is classical, and dimension two is uh, a result of Kodair and Bombieri, I, I suppose. And th in dimension three, it's uh, a result of uh, Junkai Chen and Men Chen. And so up to dimension three, the bigness of a canonical sheaf is decidable. And, and a related uh, problem is, and it it's uh, in particular closely related to the next topic, the, the case of K3 surfaces. Uh, so we can, uh, if we, can compute compute row x the the Picard number. Then uh, we can approximate approximate uh, the nef nefcon and. Uh, pseudo effective con of x uh, with uh, arbitrary precision pre pre precision so uh, it means that we, we can we can construct a uh, construct sequence of uh, rational polyhedral cones uh which which are approximate as uh, which uh appro how to say it, it the sequence converges to the nefcon or the pseudo effective form. and we, we can approximate from inside and outside but uh but it seems to me that it it's very difficult to to compute the exact uh, cones, nef con and pseudo effective con. And uh, in last five minutes, I'd like to talk about the case of K three surfaces. K three surfaces with uh, finite auto automorphism groups. Okay, and and. And the main result here is again the decidability of the isomorphism problem for K3 
K3 surfaces with finite automorphism groups. And, uh, and, and um, but before going to that result, uh, I'd like to uh, mention the following result. It's, um, it, it's also decidable. Uh, it is decidable with a uh, old x. Here, x is k, k3, old x is finite or not. <clears throat> and, and the point, the key in the proof of this lemma is uh, pass three. The first key is the result by Kondo. Uh, which is finite subgroup of automorphism group of K3 surface has order at most 3,840. And, uh, and the other key is a result of Kovac, which said that uh, automorphism group is finite if and only if uh, the uh, cones, pseudo-effective cones, uh, is a rational polyhedron. <laughs> and, and so he, here, um, so using the, uh, an argument of approximating cones and, and, and at the same time using, uh, computing the no number of automorphisms, then um, we can prove this. And then, uh, Okay, and and um, and and for for K three surface with finite automorphism group, uh, we can compute compute so fastly uh, uh, Picard number. So it is a result of um, um, Result of a uh, pawn and pawn and um, test and van van Lu Ruizic. I don't know how to pronounce, but and they proved that the computability of Picard number are assuming Tate conjecture, but Tate conjecture holds for K three surfaces, and so we can comp compute a uh, Picard number. And then uh, using a similar argument, uh, similar to the proof of uh, approximating the NEF, NEF and pseudo-effective cones. Uh, so in, in, for K3 surfaces, surface with finite automorphism group, we, we, can, we can actually compute uh, the NEF cone. Uh, we can compute NEF cone of X. <clears throat> And it, and and it's rational rational polyhedron. Okay, and, and then um, so given two K three surfaces with finite automorphism groups, then uh, we can compute an F cones, and then uh, then there are only finitely many isomorphisms of uh, neuron severity groups of X and Y preserving an F cons. And for, for each such isomorphism, we can uh, send the given, uh, the class of the given very ample sheaf to the neuron severity group of the other K3 surface. And then uh, we can compute uh, then uh, those information decide, fi determine finitely many polynomials, which are possible as the Hebert polynomial of a potential isomorphism. And in this way, we can bound the possibilities of Hebert polynomials. And then again, we do the same argument and compute isomorph iso schemes for those finitely many polynomials and then check whether it 
it's empty or not. And so the theorem is, so it is decidable with our not K3 with finite. So to or not to given K3 with finite automorphism group uh, ISO. Yeah, and uh, oh, yeah, and okay, uh, I stop here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, is there any question or comments? Yeah, thanks. I uh, can have some questions. So, oh, yeah. Uh, first, uh, so, so, so about this thing, you. You say if you can compute row x, the big uh, number, then uh, <clears throat> then then you can uh, approximate uh, the nefcon. Mm -hmm. But uh, but okay, we we know that the big big number is bounded, right? So so uh, sorry, so, so then, what did you say? Pika number is is what? What did you say? Bounded, bounded. Bound. Mm -hmm. And so can you just uh, say run from like zero? from one to like some bound and then can, can you approximate or, or you need you need the precise number to approximate uh, we we need precise number uh okay yeah so mm -hmm. yeah so, so so we try to uh okay we try to generate the cone and so we bring so effective on NEF divisors and, but uh, if we don't know the Picard number, then we never know that we have enough, enough elements which, which generates the uh, neuron survey group. And, but I mean, if say, you know that the Picard number is about by 10 and then you just run from like one to 10 is, is that can you also so if, uh, so if if rho is bounded by if we know that rho is less than or equal to 10 but yeah. if, if we our elements generate nine dimensional space then uh oh, oh, okay we don't we don't know if we should stop now or not and then we we bring another element then still that it's if it's not linearly independent to uh, those we already have, then then okay, we try another element, and then we try another element, and and so we we never know if we never know whether we should stop until we get the exact dimension. Yeah. Okay. So for for this uh, theorem, uh, so can can you bound the degree of the the map or? If if you have an isomorphism, um, um, site. So mm, I, I don't know what the degree means here, but uh, uh here so we. We bound so, Hilbert polynomials, and so I think it's here we are doing something similar to bounding degrees. Okay, uh, I see. Uh, but it seems that uh, it's more canon canonical, and uh, probably it's, it's more pro pro promising to to bound the. Hilbert polynomial, right? Than than the degree. Um, I I don't know, but I I I thought that it it's natural to look at ISO schemes, and since ISO schemes are so pieces of ISO schemes are indexed by Hilbert schemes naturally, and so I decided to look at Hilbert schemes. Okay. Thanks. So the one last question. So you, uh, 
did, did you put a paper online or? Uh, not yet. I, I not almost yet. Okay. finished writing the paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, it, it, yeah. So, so you work over Q bar, but I guess it's uh, the same if you work over C, right? Same. Or? Um. Mm, so I well, I think we need to um to work on some algorithmic problems. I think we need to work over, I know something like Qbar to 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 compute something. And yeah. so we, we have we we have to have computable inputs. And I thought it's Cuba is the most natural uh yeah. field. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for questions. Any other question or comments? Okay, so if not, let's thank speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Yasuda san. Mm, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So next meeting will be in two weeks. Okay, okay, that's all for today. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.